Welcome to the Property Voice Podcast, helping you to navigate safely through the world of property investing. Get the lowdown and updates, insights and outcomes on all matters property with a splash of entertainment along the way. The Property Voice, a voice to trust among the crowd. Now, let's get started with your host, Richard Brown. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Property Voice podcast. My name is Richard Brown and as always, it's a pleasure to have you join me again on the show today. Our summer is upon us. The sun is shining, hopefully. And I guess many of us uh, might have uh, a mindset on on a sunny beach, um, some sand or a nice pool, possibly a glass of something chilled in hand. As a result, I've got something of uh, summer sound bites of property insights to share with you over the next couple of weeks. And we're going to start today by looking at the 15 things every property investor should know. And this is inspired by something similar I saw on Quora the other day. So here we go, straight on with the show and property chatter. Okay, so let's get on with this week's featured topic with property chatter. 15 things every property investor should know. And these are some of the guiding principles or general principles of property investing that, are, that I've come across, if you like. And uh, what I've done is collected them together in a, in, a, in a summary list. They're in no particular order. It's just some, some, uh, they are presented with some of the wider considerations that, that uh, perhaps uh, are implied by some of these. So it's, uh, it's really something to keep in mind, something to, to have at hand, and something to consider as we go through our property investing journey. And one way or another, we're probably going to find them all out. <laughs> So let's crack on with this uh, Summer Soundbite series and the 15 things that every property investor should know. And starting with a big one at number one, it can set us free. Yes, financial freedom, lifestyle choices, or as I heard the other day, employment optional. Thank you for that, Scott. Um, You know, are definitely things that we can achieve through property investing. Equally, we can supplement our pension we can leave a legacy. We can help others in need, such as friends and families and good causes. So it really can set us free and indeed other people that we care about as well, other things that we care about as well. Number one. Number two, it's really not an investment. Shock. <laughs> it is active. It's not passive, even if we do pass on many of the activities to other people. And not many investments will have us take care of cash flow, sales and marketing, unpredictable revenues, costs, financial planning, regularly occurring systems and processes such as finding tenants, doing the books, maintenance and repairs and so on. So it's really not an investment at all. It is in fact a business. Coming in at number three, the buck stops with me. We can delegate authority but we always, always need to retain ultimate responsibility and accountability. We can do things ourselves. We can delegate it to other people in our team. We can even distribute tasks to other people, such such as outsource partners. But we must always retain the management and control over what we and they do. So the buck stops with me. Number four, four being an appropriate term because it's the four P's of property. You might have heard of the four P's of marketing. Well, here are the four P's of property. People, property, process, profit. People, we deal with people, whether it's tenants, advisors, agents, and tradespeople. We need to get good at that. Property, well, it probably goes without saying, I suppose. But, uh, you know, not only do we need to consider locations, investment locations and areas, you know, from a generalistic point of view, but on a, a individual property basis, we need to take care of that property, maintenance and repair. And equally, we have to have an eye on the appeal of the property. So whether that's to attract a tenant or a buyer, we definitely need to take those things into consideration. Processes. As I mentioned, it's a business and in business, we should have processes. Processes to deal with finances, tenant finding, legal and compliance issues, various systems that we need to have set up in place to manage our business. Profit, the last one. Now, profit really is kind of a, I've used the term profit, but it catches a number of points. Profit clearly being that we need to make sure that our revenue exceeds our costs, definition of profit. But equally, we need to make sure that there's more money coming in than there is going out. And profit and cash do not necessarily mean the same thing. 
Finally, we need higher levels of assets than we have liabilities, which ultimately leads on to our net worth and indeed our wealth, which I shall talk about a little bit later on. So the four P's of property. Number five, somewhat lighthearted. Who loves your baby? <laughs> well, to be quite honest, the only person really with our own best interests at heart is you or me, depending on which way you're looking at things. Others can support us. Indeed, they can reap the rewards. They can even undertake tasks on our behalf. But the person that cares the most about you and your business is ultimately and always you. Number six, it's a moving target. Property and financial cycles constantly changing. Individual projects which overrun in time or overrun on cost. Changing rules and regulations that we need to stay up to speed with and manage and control and change systems, change the way we do things, react all the time. Number seven. Steve Jobs actually gave uh, an interesting speech. One of the universities in America escapes me right now the name, but basically he gave a speech on that you can only join the, the dots looking backwards. Number seven is join the dots. Not in the Steve Jobs style necessarily, but what I'm actually trying to say here is everything is interconnected and at the same time some things are mutually exclusive. What do I mean? So everything's interconnected. Finance, planning, licensing, prices and rents, taxation. It's all connected, interconnected with one another. But at the same time, some aspects that could work for one might be mutually exclusive or hinder another item. Let me give an example. One example of being mutually exclusive is um, it might be preferential, for example, for a number of reasons to invest via a limited company. That makes sense, right? We may be able to retain more profit by investing via a limited company. But from a financing point of view, that might not be the easiest or the best thing to do, particularly when we're starting off, because lenders don't like lending to startups. So there we get a trade-off. We probably have to trade off, you know, the retained profit or tax, tax benefit of trading for a limited company when we begin, because we don't have the track record and the accounts, etc. set up to get lending as a limited company. So that's what I mean. Everything is interconnected, interdependent, but some things can be mutually exclusive. And that brings in a degree of complexity, hence the point, joining the dots. Number eight, where there's brass, there's muck. Yes, I did say it the right way around. Where there's brass, there's muck. Obviously, normally we say where there's muck, there's brass. But what I mean here, of course, is that in property, there's a lot of money. There's a lot of money involved. And where you find a lot of money, you're also going to find another things to be careful about. Greed, robbers, scandal. So we always need to take care, if you like, which leads me on to perhaps what's coming up next. Number nine, absolute or absolute is only a vodka. It doesn't exist in property. We always have to protect the downside. We always need to plan for risk and for change. And we always need to have contingencies in place, things like savings and insurance. As I say, absolute is only a vodka. Number 10, it's a horses for courses thing. For example, buy to let is a long-term, steady-as-you-go strategy. If you're looking for long-term wealth creation, gradually um, increasing over time, buy to let is very good. On the other hand, HMOs and short-term rentals, for example, have high management but high cash flow models. And they could be ideal for you know, a, a, a more rapid income replacement strategy instead. Trading property is lumpy. <laughs> it's a project-based lumpy cash flow model. Big chunks of money coming in, but having to wait for it for a period of time to happen. Rent to rent. It's a cross between the promised land and Pandora's box. It's probably the best way for me to put it. It's got high potential income because obviously we can generate an income from an asset we don't really control or own. Well, we control it, but we don't own it. But on the, at the same time, it, um, it has a lot of complexity because of the different parties that are involved and the different legal and compliance and formalities that are involved in that. So it's, it, it potentially generates high income from low funds, but it, with a degree of complexity too. So as I mentioned, it's a horses for courses thing. There is not one size fits all in terms of property investing. And what might work for one might not work for another one. 
Number 11. It's all in your mind. <laughs> yeah, you've probably heard me talk about mindset on more than one occasion. And our mindset can make or break us. What, we, what I guess we do need as qualities are, as a minimum, to be positive, solution-orientated, to be able to take calculated risks, to be dedicated, determined, and have commitment. They're the minimum things that we need to have in place to be a successful property investor. And we shouldn't o overlook FUD. <laughs> if anybody's ever done any sales training, they would have heard of FUD. Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And if you have any of those things in the mind, they will hold you back. Number 10. Oh, <laughs> I'm skipping. Sorry, number 12. I looked at number 12 and I said number 10. Number 12. Actions speak louder. Reading, talking, and dreaming will never make us an investor. We have, we have no experience with our action. And with our action, we have no experience. So we have to step out and we need to do something. And we should not let perfect be the enemy of good. This has been on my mind quite a lot, actually. I've heard a lot of people talk about things, but not do things. And sometimes it's better just to do something than to do nothing. And even if something means it could have been better, so what? That gives us experience. It gives us learning to apply for another, another, another time, another cycle. So, you know, I'm not saying be reckless and just do anything without thinking, but, you know, take, take a, a calculated step forward, but just step out. What's the worst that can happen? Actions speak louder. Number 13, our happy ever after. <laughs> so if cash flow gives us peace of mind for today, profit gives us an income for tomorrow, then our net worth creates wealth forevermore. And that is a story of our happy ever after. Number 14, for richer or poorer, <laughs> Sounds like I'm doing a wedding speech, doesn't it? For richer or poorer, the principles of leverage, compound growth and, inf and inflation can be used to make us wealthy or alternatively against us to make us poor. So we do well to understand those principles so we end up on the right side of that particular line. The principles of leverage, compound growth and inflation. And coming in right at the end, number 15, if I had my time again, or it could be letters to the grandchildren. Or it could be what I would tell my 18 or 21 year old self. If I had my time again, what would I have done? There's only one answer to that. I would have started sooner. So there we go. It's the first of my summer soundbite series, if you like. Starting today with the 15 things every property investor should know. And I just rattled through that, I know. But... Um, with the summer holidays uh, in mind, uh, I just wanted to keep it short and sweet. But tune in over the next few weeks for some more summer sound bites. Meanwhile, the show notes are available on the website, thepropertyvoice.net. And that's all for now. But what other principles should be on the list? I just, just thinking to myself, you know, should there be more than 15? What would be on your list of the what every property investor should know? Why don't you just drop me a quick email, podcast at thepropertyvoice.net, and let me have a list of your top tips. Maybe we'll have, even have enough for another series. Or another episode, rather. Not necessarily another series. But for now, that's all for this week on the Property Voice podcast. I really do appreciate you listening and tuning in. And until next time, it's ciao, ciao. Thank you for listening today. Now head over to thepropertyvoice.net for more inspirational content and get updates through our mailing list. Join us next time on the Property Voice podcast. And if you enjoyed the show, please don't forget to rate us on iTunes.